A good afternoon to all of those of you on the East Coast. We want to wish you a happy Purim. Those on the Central Coast, I'm sorry, the Central Time Zone, the West Coast, a good morning. It should be a very, very meaningful day, a, a wonderful Purim day. To those of our listeners who are following from Europe, from Israel, many of you are probably winding down Purim. Many of you are probably having a, a festive meal with your families, with your friends. And to those in Jerusalem, you'll just be starting in a couple of hours from now. And we want to wish you a happy Shushan Purim. That distinction between Jerusalem and the walled cities we'll get to later in the, in the talk. Today is a, is a fascinating day because it commemorates one of the most meaningful events in all of Jewish history, all of biblical history, something that's analyzed and studied by Christians and Jews across the world. And that is the story of Esther and Mordechai and of Purim. It's particularly relevant today because 2,500 years after the Purim story, 2,600 years after the Purim story, we are confronting a, once again, a major Persian empire. Not, in, not since Alexander of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, and the Greek and Macedonian armies conquered the civilized world from Persia, has there been a dominant Persian empire like we are seeing today. And of course, I'm referring to Iran and its Shia hegemonic caliphate that extends throughout the Arabian Gulf, throughout the Middle East, going from the Arabian Gulf to the Mediterranean. We'll get back to that later. What's the story of Purim? What's the context? Well, as all of you are familiar, the Jews settled in Israel, first under the leadership of Moses and his chief disciple, Joshua, when they came in 40 years after having been liberated from Egyptian slavery, they settled in Israel. And it took time to develop, but under King David, under King Solomon, Israel developed into a major international power, much larger than the land mass of today's modern Israel. But things went, unfortunately, went sour. There was a split in the empire, and you had two Jewish kingdoms. The northern kingdom that entailed 12, 10 of the 12 tribes. That's known as Samaria. Today we use that term Samaria, Shomron. That was the northern part of the kingdom. The southern part of the kingdom, in which David and Solomon had come from, the tribe of Judah, known as Judea, okay, Judea, that was the southern kingdom. The 10, the 10 northern tribes ultimately were conquered and then taken into captivity and scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire. What's Assyria? Assyria, you and I would say, is today's Turkey, today's Syria, and a, and a piece of today's Iraq. It was a major, major northern kingdom. At that time in history, you had two major empires. You had the Assyrian Empire in the north, Mesopotamia, again, Syria, Turkey, part of today's Iraq. And you had a great southern empire that was known as Mitzrayim. We always translate Mitzrayim as Egypt, that's probably a poor translation. And the reason that's a poor translation is because Mitzrayim was about the northern third of the, the African continent. We're talking about Egypt, Libya, Sudan, all the way going south into Black Africa, all the way going south to the point of Eritrea, Kenya, Uganda. So it was a major empire. It had the whole Nile River Basin. What was always in between the, those two major empires? What was the travel route that linked the African continent, together with the European and Asian continents, anyone who's traveling from Europe or Asia into Africa, anyone who's traveling from Africa into Asia or Europe has to go through Israel. It is the linchpin. It was the most precious, most significant piece of real estate in all of antiquities because it was the linchpin that, that really brought together the civilized world. It was a trade route. So you had the two southern tribes. The 10 northern tribes essentially assimilated out. That's why we call them the 10 lost tribes. Not all of them, but the large majority ended up assimilating out to, into various other groups that had been moved throughout the Assyrian Empire. And I just want to clarify what that means. Think about what Joseph Stalin did to the population of the Crimea. He took them and he scattered them throughout the USSR. And he transplanted other populations there that would be much more pro-Soviet, pro-Russian. That is exactly what the Assyrians did with anyone they conquered. That prevented people from rebelling. That prevented people from challenging the empire. And 
we lost most of those 10 northern tribes. The two southern tribes eventually are conquered by Babylonia. Babylonia is a key term. Today, we call it Iraq. Babylonia was, was a, m- the majority of today's Iraq, part of today's Turkey. It was a very, very significant empire. And of course, it controlled the um, what we call the Fertile Crescent, the area between the two great rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. It was very, very significant. It was very fertile. It was, it was quite wealthy. And they conquered the two southern tribes. Initially, they would have preferred to have Judea, meaning the two southern tribes, those Jews, the remaining Jews. That's, by the way, we, why, do, why did the Germans call us Juden? Why in Hebrew are we known as Yehudim? Why in English are we known as Jews? It all comes from the word Yehuda, which was the, the major of the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Judah was the major tribe. Most of the people were from Judah. That's why we're called Yehudim. Yes, somebody like myself is a Levi. There are people who are Kohanim, right? Descend from Aaron the priest. Th- those are minorities. People from Benjamin, they're the major- minority. So we were known as, as Yehudim or Jews. And what happened? The Babylonians would have preferred had we been a vassal state that paid significant taxes to them. It didn't work. We ended up rebelling. Even though our king, our our executive, and much of the aristocracy, much of the financial leadership of the country was taken into Iraq to a place called Nahar Kvar. Kvar was a tributary off the Euphrates River, and they set up concentration camps. Not, not, Not death camps like you think of when you think of Auschwitz, but concentration camps, work camps where people, these Jewish um, the leadership work there with their families, live there under very difficult conditions. Eventually, were, and were allowed to establish themselves in the Babylonian communities along the Euphrates and Tigris River, and that happened. Okay, but the Jews who were left back in Judea in Yehuda they, the assumption the Babylonians made, would not revolt. But they did. They did not want to be controlled by the Babylonians. They revolted and they lost. It was an ugly, ugly war. It was a three-year war. But in 516, the culmination was, the con- I apologize, in 586 before the Common Era, the culmination of those three years of war from 588 down to 586, the culmination was the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And these Jews were taken in chains and shackles, and they were taken along the Via Maris up through the Judean hills north of Jerusalem, through Samaria, cutting across Jordan into Iraq, and they were they were they were basically exiles, captives of the Babylonians. And at this point, most Jews no longer lived in Judah. They now were exiles, refugees living in Babylonia. And that was the scenario from 586 before the Common Era, which is marked by the Ninth of Av, the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, And that goes on for about 52 years. Something happens that no one could have predicted. And that's really where our story begins. There was an alliance between the Persians and the Medians. None of them, if Vegas, if you were sitting at the table at Vegas, no one would have bet against the great Babylonian empire. Again, Babylonia is today's Iraq. But they set up an alliance And they sent in almost like a KGB hit team, an assassin team. And they assassinated Belshazzar, the Babylonian monarch. With his assassination, the country was in a state of chaos, went into a free fall, didn't have the structure where it could reestablish itself. And the Persian-Median alliance ends up defeating 
the great Babylonian empire. This is a great empire that the empire literally reigned from northern Africa after conquering Egypt, Mitzrayim, all the way through the Persian Gulf. Controlled the Middle East, controlled parts of southern Europe, it controlled the Persian Gulf, it controlled parts of the uh, what we call today the caravan route, the travel route to India. It was a massive empire. It was by far the most dominant empire on earth. And now it was controlled by the Persian Median Alliance. First, there was a King Cyrus, who was fairly, fairly philo-Semitic. It was good to the Jews. Eventually, he's replaced by a man who grew up in the military, very much like the way that Saddam Hussein gained power in Iraq or Gaddafi gained power in Libya. It wasn't someone who came from aristocracy. He was a commoner, but he seized power. In English, we call him Artaxerxes. In Hebrew, he's known as Achash Verosh. He becomes the monarch of the most powerful empire on earth, the Persian Median Empire, which controls under his rule. It expands all the way from Black Africa to India. 127 provinces under his control in domain. He expanded the empire, maybe some will say too rapidly, but he ended up controlling the civilized world, which means that 98% of all Jews living on the earth are under the control of the Persian Median Empire. What happened? And I'm taking a step back. He was a commoner. He had aspirations for greatness. When Belshazzar, the Babylonian emperor, was killed, his daughter, the royal princess, her name was Vashti. She's got two choices. She hates and she despises the Persians. These are the Persians who assassinated her father, who defeated her country. She despises them, but she's got two choices. She's going to be violated by the Persians, or she can play the game and marry one of these major Persian people. In this case, she marries a, a significant military leader, the, this man, Artaxerxes. By marrying him, she stays in power. She not only stays in power, but she can continue the life of luxury that she's had her whole life. This was not a healthy marriage, you can imagine. He needed her because she was aristocracy. She was everything that he wasn't as a former commoner, as a, a, a brilliant but a thug who essentially seized power. She gave him legitimacy. On the other hand, she despised being married to him, but had no choice but to be married to him. Keep that in the context as we move forward. Now that he becomes the king, one of the things he does, and we know this from the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, he puts a building freeze on the city of Jerusalem. Under Cyrus, Jews had been allowed to return back to Israel to reestablish themselves in their homeland. But Artaxerxes did not want to have a strong Jewish presence. He didn't want to have a temple rebuilt, not in the middle of his empire, not in the most pe significant piece of real estate in his empire. So he literally puts a building freeze on Jerusalem. Most of the Jews are living in Persia. Okay, They're living in Persia itself. The capital city, Shushan Habira, what we call Shushan, today is the Iranian city of Hamadan. Okay? And in, in Hamadan, the Jews and the Muslims have traditions going back thousands of years as to the grave of Mordechai and the grave of Esther, who we'll get into. Okay? He needs, in his mind, to solidify, to win over all of these countries, the 127 Medinot, these, these various countries that he's conquered, who probably are not particularly happy being under the control of a Persian monarch, of a Persian empire, of a Persian military. He wants to somehow ingratiate himself to them, win them over, and he sets up a series of festivities and feasts. And he tries to wine and dine them, he tries to ingratiate them, he tries to enable them 
to see the positive benefits of being part of the Persian Empire. After that, he realizes he's made a mistake. You can't ignore your own people. If any of these countries revolt, if any of these countries want to break off from the empire, you know, his, his nucleus, his solid base is what? His solid base is his own people. So he goes and he engages in, in a series of festivities and feasts. You can imagine the cost to the government of, of running these series of parties. He does this for his own fellow Persians because he's got to solidify his base, his nucleus. He's much more comfortable amongst the common folk than he was amongst the aristocracy from these various countries. And he allows himself to become inebriated and drunk. And when someone becomes drunk, their guard is down and we see who and what they really are. In that drunken state, what does he do? He's going to deal with his wife who's always cut him down to size whenever there was a fight she would she would compare him to her father her father was this great babylonian empire emperor he was royalty he knew how to handle his drink he knew how to articulate and this common thug is nothing more than the stable boy that he was when he grew up and you can imagine with his frail male ego that didn't do too well that didn't go over very well at all well he's going to fix her and he demands that she comes out and presents herself with only the royal crown on her head, as he's going to show off this beautiful wife of his, which is another way of saying he's going to put her in her place. And he's going to show, you know, he's going to show her who's the boss. Well, she responded, no, but she didn't just respond, no. She sent a message publicly to let him know what a drunken slob and what an uncouth fake of a king that he is. This craze created a stir. One of the government officials looking to seize the opportunity, because the king was a little bit perplexed, what does he do in this situation? And no one wanted to give him advice because, you know, it's a catch-22. You don't want to be the one who says you should execute the queen when he really did love her and care about her, and then he'll hold it against you. On the other hand, you don't want to say do nothing and give clemency when it undermines his position and status. So no one really had great advice to give him. But Haman jumps forward. Why does he jump forward? He sees an opportunity to manipulate the king. And the scholars say about this Haman, okay, who the man, and we'll get into why, was a diabolical anti-Semite. He was incredible when it came to character assassination. Because when he would badmouth someone, the way that he did it, it was never about his personal hatred. It was never about his personal agenda. He always presented himself as a third party observer who own, his only concern was protecting the welfare of the king, having the king's back. It was never about him, even though we know it was always about him. And that's the story of Homer. And he convinces the king that there's going to be a feminist revolution if he doesn't stand up. And the very people who, who are out on the street, the common man, right? Every dirty politician, they're always defending the common man. That's just, that's the MO of every dirty politician. That if you don't stand up, you know, what will happen is every wife, when Archie Bunker comes home and asks Edith for his beer and Twinkies, every wife will tell him to go stick it, and, you know, go jump in the lake. You've got to stand up for the needs of the common man. And off with her head. At this point, in, in the scholars analyze what was Haman's motivation. One of his motivations was what you and I know as the bloodless revolution. If you want to seize power, if you want to become the most powerful man on earth, you don't have a military, you don't have an army, how are you going to do it? You marry into power. This was an opportunity for his daughter to become the next queen of the civilized world the next queen of the Persian Median Empire. And the other members of the royal cabinet understood this. And they understood, and if I can use a modern analogy, what Joseph Stalin did to every member of the Politburo, what Joseph Stalin did to every member of, of uh, Vladimir Lenin's disciples, killing them off so he could seize power, Look, Leonid, Leonid Trotsky actually fled all the way from Russia to Mexico 
And it was finally the third assassination attempt that Joseph Stalin's goons killed Trotsky. They saw Haman doing this to them. As he was seizing power and in, in, in jumping ahead of them in, in terms of his role in running the government, his positioning, they understood that if they don't get a wife who is going to be someone that can keep this very, very frail, insecure king, this frail, insecure king who needs approbation, who needs to be loved, who needs to be appreciated, who needs other people's accolades, they're going to have a real problem. So what do they do? In the context of the king searching for a new queen, they literally abducted all young women. They took all young women to the palace. They abducted them. They prepared them to spend a night with the king, to, to eat with the king, to dine with the king, to sleep with the king. And this young woman, Esther, a young Jewish woman who was raised as an orphan, her, her father had died before her birth, after conception. Her mother died in childbirth. She happened to be raised by her first cousin, by Mordechai. The world didn't know who she was. You know, she was raised in a very humble way, but she was raised by a, a, an outstanding man, her first cousin. And she is chosen to be the next queen. Why was this young Jewish woman chosen? Because the other members of the royal cabinet, incredibly, incredibly threatened and scared that Haman would do to them what Stalin did to the members of the Politburo said, we've got to do collusion. We've got to choose a woman that every one of us, if we support her, has a chance of being the next queen over Haman's daughter. Why'd they like Esther? Because Esther was everything that Vashti wasn't. But at the same time, she was everything that Vashti was. What did Vashti have going for her? She was bright. She was stimulating. She was challenging. She was engaging. The problem is Vashti had a chip on her shoulder, and she would always put him down and cut him at the knees. Esther had the brains, the brilliance, the stimulation of Vashti. But the difference was, Esther, on the other hand, Esther knew how to massage his frail ego. Wasn't going to threaten him, wasn't going to cut him down, wasn't going to put him in his place. And with their encouragement, the king was enamored with Esther. And she is chosen to be the next queen. Skip ahead. Haman, who now has literally jumped over all of the other ministers, is in the prime minister role, wears icons on his bosom, and people were obligated to, to bow down, to defer to the Persian god that he would wear, which subconsciously they're bowing down to him. It was a way for him to, to gain power over people. In the Jew Mordechai, Esther's first cousin, was a great scholar, who's one of the refugees, one of the Babylon from when the Babylonians took the leadership out of Israel, he refuses to bow down. He won't defer to a pagan god. And Haman obsesses not just over Mordechai, Haman obsesses over Mordechai and everything he stands for. And he comes to the king and he says, Am mefuzar mefurad. You have a problem. Haman's the one who really had a problem, but he portrayed it as a problem for the king. This group is mefuzar. They're a cancer that has metastasized. It's not like you can control them in one little area. They live on the Tigris. They live on cities in the Euphrates. They live here in what is today's Iran, right? In places like Hamadan and Tehran. They're in North Africa. They're in the Middle East. Do you understand? They don't observe the way the Persians observe. They don't defer in respect to other religions. They don't marry our women so they become their own clan, their own unique, distinct clan. And what do they do? They're there to undermine you. When, when it's their holidays, they don't produce for the economy. When it's our holidays, they don't show us the respect by observing those holidays. They're a threat. They're a threat that is, is an existential, mortal threat to your survival as the king. 
And the king who was paranoid was willing, not because the king loved Jews. He was not a diabolical anti-Semite. He had a history of anti-Semitism. He's the man who, who imposed the building freeze on Jerusalem. But what Haman con convinced him is that it's in his interest to eradicate the Jews, to take their wealth. They won't be a threat to his empire. They won't be a threat to his children's empire. And he removes the royal signet, Hasara Tatabat. He gives Haman the ability one day to open up all of the garrisons, to open up all of the armories, to arm the people to perpetuate a genocide against world Jewry. From the travel routes to India, through the Persian Gulf, through the Middle East, through Northern Africa, all Jews will be the, the, the principle, thou shalt not murder, will not exist. The armories and garrisons will be open for one day. Not only will the, the police be armed, but the population will have the right to bear arms, to use those arms to slaughter the Jews. That year, we're talking about 519 before the Common Era. The Jews are in a state of confusion. Of, of disbelief. It was only a couple of years earlier that they were brought to Ahasuerus' series of festivities. They were provided kosher food, they were provided kosher wines, they were treated with respect, there were Jews who were government officials, and then to go from that status to a status of genocide, to a status of being a pariah, a despised pariah that must be eradicated, the Jews were in a state of shock and awe, and that shock and awe turned into depression. And Mordechai said to Esther, you've got to act. You've got to act, and you've got to act now. Esther was hesitant. The king had not been with her. He'd spent all his time with the, the women in the harem, and she wanted to wait till a time that was auspicious and appropriate. He says, you don't have the luxury. On the street here, you, you, you don't see this because you're sheltered in the royal cap, in the royal palace. But let me tell you something. The raping Jewish women, they're breaking into Jewish homes, to Jewish stores. They're ransacking our assets. They're beating up Jews. And no policeman's going to stop them. Because in 11 months from now, when the lottery that Haman took, when the garrisons will be open, the armories will be open, it'll be too late at that point. Because why would a Persian policeman incarcerate, attack his fellow Persian, his cousin, his neighbor, for, for attacking a Jew when a Jew is going to be dead anyways. And right now we're almost at the point of no return. You've got no choice. You have to act. So she says to Mordechai, listen, for the next three days, have the Jews of Shushan fast. I'm going to fast. Because Mordechai said, look, I can tell you this. You've got to act. You can't delay. You've got to act. You've got to act now. What to do and how to do it, I can't tell you. Because I don't know the players. You live with Ahasuerus. You are there when they have meetings. You hear, you see the dynamic. What to do, only you can know. And what does she do? She has everyone fast. That year, there was no observance of the Passover. Instead of people sitting down to a Passover Seder, in wonderful clothing, having the matzah, the maror, the family coming together. That year in Shushan, in Hamadan, the Shushan was the capital of the Persian Empire. The Jews of Shushan, they wore sackcloth, they put ashes on, they fasted, they mourned, and they repented. It was a time of repentance. It was not a time of celebration. And after three long days of trying to come up with a plan that she thinks will work, she, she, she basically engages in the plan. What does she do? She comes to the king. Now, you understand, the king, there had been a number of assassination plots. He's shocked at why is the queen showing up risking her life. It's a capital offense to approach the king if you haven't been subpoenaed. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, he's terribly guilty because he realizes, you know, he's been monkeying around in the harem all these months. and He hasn't been paying attention and showing affection to this very righteous wife of his who loves him and cares about him. So he extends the golden scepter, which gives her a license, which gives her a pass that she will not be executed. She can now approach the king 
He says, honey, what is it? What's your request? What are you asking for? And she looks at him. She says, honey, I miss you, my dear. I would love nothing more than an intimate evening, just me and you and Haman. You can imagine what's going through the king's eyes, the king's mind, I apologize. You know the phrase, two's company, three's a crowd? What are you risking your life, you and me and Haman? I understand it would just be the two of us. And right away, he's obsessing. He's thinking that my, quote unquote, my prime minister, my best friend, the man who has my back, supposedly, is having an affair with my wife. My wife, who I thought loved me, who I trusted, who I respected, is having an affair with my best friend. And all night, they're whining and dining, and she's laughing at all of Haman's jokes, and she's looking at him with awe and respect, and the king is going crazy. He can't sleep that night. At the end of the feast, he said to her, come on, what is it that you really want? What are you really asking for? And she says to him, honey, this was such a, an exalted evening. This was such an experience. I'd love nothing more than tomorrow night to do it all again. Just me, you, and Haman. If you were the king, you wouldn't have slept that night either. And he doesn't, he just, he can't understand it. How can this be? How do I not know about this? How come no one shared this with me? What, what, where's my secret service? Why hasn't anyone stuck their neck out? And he asks, he says, bring me the chronicles. Is, is it, is maybe my reputation that if you stick your neck out, you save the king, you know, that, that, that I don't reward you. I thought that I've always ingratiated myself. I thought that I've always bestowed, you know, bounty upon people that, that I wanted to, that I thought were close to me. They said, yeah, there's a Jew, like as in the people that you're about to allow to be eliminated, to be annihilated, to be slaughtered. There was a Jew who risked his life, his Mordechai, he stuck out his neck. And it, we, we discovered that there were two officials in the government who would set up a plot to execute you. You'd be dead today if it wasn't for that Jew. And now he's even more furious. The next morning, Haman comes in. Because that night, Haman strutted like a peacock. Haman, he strutted like a peacock. He was so excited over the fact that he was the only minister. The very woman who wasn't his daughter, who, who was, so to speak, you know, the, the term Antichrist, it was the anti Haman's daughter, the, the queen that everyone else wanted, but not him. And he only invites her. And she, I apologize. She only invites him to the only one invited with the king. And she's enamored and she's uh, and she's excited and she's in awe of him. And he's feeling incredibly well. And as he goes home to brag this to his wife and to his children and to his friends, who does he cross paths with? Mordechai. Mordechai, the Jew who will not bow down to him. He says, I can't wait another 11 months when there's going to be a genocide of all these Jews. I want this Jew dead and I want him now. And his wife says to him, well, you don't want to get yourself thrown in prison. Why don't you get a special license from the king? When you have your cabinet meeting tomorrow, you, the prime minister and the king, why don't you ask for it? And as he comes in that morning, king says to him, because now the king doesn't trust him, unbeknownst to Haman, he says, my friend, what would you do to the man the king would want to honor? the man that the king would want to show the world that this is someone who cares about me. The king set up a Rorschach test for Haman. Because a normal person, what would they ask for? A government monopoly. The best job you could have in antiquities was a government monopoly if the king gave you the right to collect taxes over a city, over a province. He gave a certain percentage to the government, anything above and beyond that, you, you kept yourself. That's what he should have asked for. Think about Oscar Schindler. The man never made it in business until 1939. After 1945, he was an absolute failure, a drunken failure. After a while, the, 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 the families that we called the Schindler Juden, they stopped putting him in business. They just supported him monthly. It was cheaper than trying to set him up in business. 
Well, he, that's what Haman should have asked for, because in 1939 to 1945, Oscar Schindler was an exceedingly successful, wealthy man. When you have government contracts, when you have government monopolies, you can do very well. But what does Haman do? And this tells you everything about Haman. What did Haman want? Put on the king's royal robe. Put a put the king's royal crown on the man's head. Give that man the golden scepter. Put that man on the king's horse and take him throughout the capital city where all the dignitaries are, where all the aristocracy comes from across the world and call out This is the man. This is what we do for the man that the king wants to honor. The king says to himself, I'm dead. This guy wants my throne. Haman gave it away. He showed what is going on in his subconscious. No rational person that was not filled with an inflated ego that wanted to take over the, the role of the king, wanted to become the most powerful man on earth, would ever ask, answer a question that way. The king sent to secret service. What does the king do? I want you to do everything. I love it. I love it. And you know what? Don't leave out one detail. Haman think it, think, thinks that the king is going to do this for him. I want you to do that for Mordecai the Jew. That's right, the Jew. And he tells the Secret Service, don't let this guy get out of your sight. And Haman has to bring Mordecai all around the capital city, calling out. He's humiliated. After the worst day in his life, they don't even allow him to shower, to shave, to change. No deodorant, nothing. They bring him for the second second feast. And they're sitting there with this incredible wines, foods, service. And they're having supposedly the time of their life. The king is choking on his food. He can't stand it. But Esther is hanging on to every word of Haman, and the king is getting more and more furious. The king says, okay, we've played this charade for the last two days. What do you really want? Come on. Come on. What do you really want? And when she answers that question at that time, two things happen. What does she say? I'm begging for my life. I want to live. I just don't want to be executed. And I'm begging for the lives of my people. If we had been sold into slavery, at least there's benefit. If we would be your public servants, you would get benefit. But this sick, diabolical man, all he wants to do is undermine you. He wants to undermine anyone who's around you. He, he was the one that led to the death of your first wife. Now he wants to take away your second wife. The very people who are your most loyal servants, the people who risk their lives to save your life, these are the people he wants to kill. The king is filled with rage, rage, and he explodes, runs out, of the, out into the garden. But two things are going on in the mind of the king. Because the king had questioned his own ability to understand people, to know people. The two people he thought were the closest to him, the two people he thought were, were, were the ones that cared about him the most, now he assumed as having an affair with each other, wanting to assassinate him. What does he discover? He discovers that he was, he was really correct. He was really right about his wife. She does care about him. She does love him. He hasn't lost any ability to understand, to, to appreciate relationships. But at the same time, rage that this guy has played him, manipulated him, strung him along and played him like a fiddle for his own purposes, always under the guise of, oh, I'm just looking after the king. I want to make sure that the king is okay and protected. Always under that guise. And what does he do? He has Haman, because one of the, the members of actually the commentaries believe 
that it was one of Mem- uh, Haman's, you know, Persian Muslim Brotherhood party, the, the Persian Nazi party that Haman had led. One of those people saw that things were going the wrong way and he jumped ship. His name was Harvona. He says, yeah, he says, your majesty, he says, just take a look at that massive erection there, taller than any of the Persian temples, taller than, than your palace. He set up an erection of a gallow where the Jew who tried to save your life is going to swing by his broken neck. And, and the king is furious. He says, I want this. He's dead. He's dead now. Take him now and let him swing from the very gallows. And Haman was killed. There's a problem, though. What about the genocide decree? What about the decree that had been translated into every language in the empire, written in every script in the empire, that said in 11 months from now, the garrisons and the armories are going to be open? And the population can arm themselves and use those arms to slaughter the Jews. So the king never rescinds a decree because it would make him look like he was wrong. What he did do was two things. He appointed Mordechai his new prime minister. And he allowed Mordechai and Esther to come up with new legislation that would save the Jews. And they came up with a legislation that said the following. On that very day, the 13th of Adar, The Jews have the ability and the right to do what? To arm themselves from the very same garrisons. And we're encouraging all police, all military, those who normally do have arms, who represent the government, to stand by the Jews and allow the Jews to defend themselves. Now, before we get to that, which is 11 months down the road, keep in mind the following. This young woman, I don't know how old Esther was. But this young woman, who didn't have a chance to sit and get advice and talk it out with others, worked out a system that ultimately saved the Jews from genocide. She understood that who Haman was. You can throw, trust him as far as you can throw him. you got to keep him in your sight. She understood that the king was fickle, that even if she could convince the king, she had to have Haman there because he would get the king to flip back. She wanted to make sure that the Jews were not going to rely on her. Let it be known, you know, that that while the Jews are going to suffer genocide, she's sitting there whining and dining with the king and Haman. They had no idea she was Jewish, so she didn't want, when she risked her life, their guard's going to be up. Why now is she all of a sudden risking her life? So she she did something that played all of the angles and played all of the psyche and all of the players. She was brilliant. She was brilliant, incredibly psychologically astute. And the king, who was an anti-Semite, not a diabolical anti-Semite, but an anti-Semite, ended up flipping and understanding that the Jews were not his problem. The Jews were not a threat, but the Jews were just the opposite sincerely loyal and patriotic. And we'll get to the end of the story, but I want to share with you. Three years after this event, the king died. There's a son, Darius. Till this day, Iranian Jews, Persian Jews, name their children Daryush in Persian. Daryush or Darius in English and Hebrew, Daryavesh, after this man. Because the next Persian empire, who led the Persian Median Empire, rescinded the building decree and commanded under the guidance of a prime minister Mordechai, a Jewish prime minister, under the guidance of Esther, who was the queen, his, you know, his, his father's queen, and allowed the Jews to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And this began a movement that took time, very much like what we've seen in the last 75 years. But it began a movement of the Jews returning to their ancestral homeland, ultimately reestablishing themselves with a very good relationship with the Persian Empire, being part of the greater Persian Empire, paying taxes, being supported by the Persian Empire, and rebuilding the temple, reestablishing Jewish autonomy there, reestablishing Jewish education, Jewish values, Jewish 
charity institutions, Jewish chesed institutions. It was all brought about by this young woman who under the worst of conditions came up with a plan that turned our fate from a fate of genocide and annihilation to one of salvation, to one of returning the refugees and the exiles to their to their eternal homeland. So what happened? On that day, the 13th of Adar, despite the fact that the Jews had the right to defend themselves, that the military, that the police were working in collusion because of their fear of Mordechai and because of their respect for Mordechai, to defend the Jews, there were still 70, 75,000 people throughout the empire who attempted to attack the Jews, to kill Jews, who lost their lives attempting to slaughter Jews. The whole core, the whole nucleus of this anti-Semitic, of what we'll call the, you know, the, the, the Persian Nazi party or the Persian Muslim Brotherhood party, was in, was in Shushan. They were Haman's people, Haman's sons, his friends, his people. They were smart. They went underground. They did what Sinwar's doing. They're hiding in the tunnels surrounded by, by, by the captives. They're doing what Muhammad Def is doing right now. They went underground. And she comes to him at the end of that day and she asks for the following. She says, my fear is that the real cause of this trouble, they'll wait. They'll wait till the time is right. They might wait for an, the next administration and they'll come back and they'll come back with a vengeance. Same point that Israel's making about Rafah. If you don't dismantle those four battalions, if you don't get to the leadership of Hamas, they'll come back and they'll come back with a vengeance. They'll use the same border where, where Iranian, Russian, Chinese, and North Korean bombs have been transferring over that border, which has armed Hamas over the last 16 years. The same will continue. You'll have to dismantle the infrastructure. And he gives her the right to do that. He gives the Jews gives the Jews the right to go continue going to the garrisons, going to the armories, arming themselves, now not in self-defense, but to go on the offensive in the capital city, which is the heart and it's the core of, of the anti-Semitic group. And then the next day, while people across the world, because remember, there was only license for 24 hours, once the armory, I'm sorry, the armaments, once the swords, once the attack weapons, once they've been returned to the garrisons and armories, now the Jews can breathe. And what did they do? They had a meal of gratitude to God, where they thanked God, they sang praises of God, that took care of their own because it was a time of incredible unity, even though the Jews had been scattered throughout the Persian Empire as a function of their state of diaspora, they unified together. They had the spontaneous expression of gratitude throughout the empire, not the Jews in Shusha. What did they do? They were going into the hornet's nest. They were going into the tunnels of Gaza City and Kanyunis and Jabalia. That's what they were doing. And they were successful. And they went on the attack and they took, they, they executed Haman's partners, Haman's children who were involved. And the next day, they expressed their gratitude for the fact that they survived not only the first day in defense mode, but they were successful and survived the second day in offensive mode. And what Mordechai and Esther did is they went to the scholars in exile and they asked, we would like to legislate a day We'd like to legislate a day to reenact every year so that we remember this event in history, the way that the Jews celebrated. So on the 14th of Adar, which is today, world Jewry expresses the gratitude that we went from, from literally genocide. And by the way, when I say genocide, I mean it. You know, people used to say, ah, this is fairy tales. This is a, a, a story that never happened. Yeah. After, after Hitler, they realized that this is not fairy tales. This can happen. This is a reality. 
And you can go just like the German Jews did from being in a position of power and influence like that. Think about what's happened to the Jews in America since October 7th. Things can flip in a way that you can't even imagine. And they can flip with a speed and a ferociousness like we've seen since October 7th. And this was their opportunity to show their gratitude. They legislated. It's a day when we, to reflect the fact that the Jewish people worldwide united and came together. It's a day where we give each other charity. Those who need, we don't give them food items because they need to pay the, the rent. They need to pay the, the, um, the gas bill, the electric bill, the utility bills. That's why we take care of the poor. Those who can take care of themselves financially, we show our unity by inviting them over for a meal. We come together with them. We work with them. You know, we either go to give them food pro gifts, they give us food gifts. It's, what is the idea of food? It's, it's the idea of bonding. People bond together over a meal. And that's why this festive meal where we, we, we get together with each other. And that was legislated. And the story was written in a way that it became one of the books of the Bible. It's called the Megillah of Esther, not the Megillah of Esther and Mordechai. Mordechai is the one who told her, you've got to act. We don't have the time to wait. You've got to act now because it'll be beyond the point of no return. But it was she who came up with the plan. And it was with God's help. Her plan was incredibly successful. So we mentioned something that the Jews in Jerusalem, they're not, they didn't observe the holiday like the rest of Israeli Jews. The Jews in Tiberias, the Jews in the walled cities, they observe like the Jews in Shushan, in Hamadan. Why is that? So Maimonides, right, the great scholar, the great logician, he said the following. When they legislated the perpetual observance of the way the Jews celebrated their salvation, they legislated it not just for the Jews of Shushan, that they get their own special holiday, because they sacrificed the most. They were not just in defensive mode. They had to go into the hornet's nest to ultimately uproot what would have been a further, a second round of, of horrific, horrific attacks from Haman's people. It's not just they who get their own special holiday, because they sacrifice more than anyone else. But you know who else gets their own special holiday? The Jews of the walled cities. What does it mean, the walled cities? The walled cities were the ones who suffered the most in the destruction by the Babylonians. See, the open cities just put up the white flag. They couldn't defend themselves. They put up the white flag. And they even were allowed to stay in Israel. But the Jews of the walled cities that fought to the death, think about Jerusalem. It was a three-year siege. And then when they broke the siege, it was three and a half weeks till they got to the Temple Mount. When you go to Jerusalem, when you go in the Jaffa Gate, it takes you 12 minutes if you go through the Arab Shuk. If you go around the Armenian and Jewish quarter, it takes you 16 minutes. How did it take the Babylonians three and a half weeks, four weeks? Huh? You know why it took? Because every inch of Jerusalem was a battlefield. There were battles going on, rivers of blood, Babylonian and Jewish blood. And when they finally succeeded in destroying Jerusalem, take no prisoners. It's not at the end of the football game where we trade jerseys and autograph and take a picture together. They took no prisoners. Who suffered the most? The ones who sacrificed for Jerusalem, for the God of Israel, for the Jewish people, for the sovereignty of the Jewish nation. The ones who sacrificed the most were the Jews of the walled cities. So when they instituted this holiday, just like they said, the Jews of Shushan who sacrificed the most get their own special holiday. We're going to acknowledge, not just in a case where we won, where we were successful in defeating our enemies, but let's go back a couple of generations. Let's go back to our grandparents' generation. We need to acknowledge those who sacrificed the most for the Jewish nation, for the land of Israel, for Jerusalem, for the temple, for the God of Israel for the values of the Jewish people, for the values that God gave the Jewish people. We have to acknowledge that they sacrifice more than anyone else. They also get their own special holiday, just like the Jews of Shushan.
doesn't matter whether you're a winner or a loser. So in the case of Shushan, they were the winners. In the case of Jerusalem and Tiberias, they were the losers. They lost. They were defeated. That's not the point. It's the sacrifice. It's the commitment. It's the struggle. And when they legislated the holiday, one day for everyone, a special, unique day for those who sacrificed the most, the Jews of Shushan and the Jews of the walled cities. And that's why starting tonight, Israel time, which is almost now, which will be about an hour from now, the Jews in Tiberias and in, in Jerusalem, and in Je there's no Jews living in Jericho, but the Jews of the walled cities, they're the ones, the walled cities from the time of the first temple, they're the ones who have a special holiday, like the Jews of Shushan. And where we're going to end is the following. The great Persian Empire, which had been such a, had such a positive start, you know, it's, the previous administrations had been very philo-Semitic, very pro-Israel. With the turn of time, it was the one time in Jewish history there could have been an absolute genocide of world Jewry. We said 98% of world Jewry lived in, in the land that was the Persian Empire, the 127 provinces. Think about with the, when the state of Israel started, the one oil producing nation that would sell petroleum to Israel was Iran, it was Persia, Iran. With the revolution, everything changed. With that revolution, they're trying to annihilate us. The IRGC over the last 30 years has trained six Iranian proxies with the goal of the annihilation of the state of Israel. They're developing nuclear capabilities with the goal of destroying Tel Aviv and Israel. And this is a tragedy. We've always got to be diligent and always understand and learn from history. And we pray and we yearn that what happened to Haman and to his whole call it entourage or his whole system of trying to perpetuate a genocide where they would literally take the, 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 the weapons of destruction, the military weapons and use it against world Jewry. In the end, it failed. And we hope and we yearn that the Supreme Ayatollah, the Imams, the IRGC, everything that they've been working for, towards, everything they've been building towards over the last 30 some years, that ultimately fails. It ultimately fails, not just because of the tragedy of what it would mean to Israel and the Jewish world, but what the tragedy that would mean for humanity. Unfortunately, the names have changed. So from Haman, it's now the Ayatollah. From, from Haman and his crew, it's now the IRGC and Hezbollah. But we're facing again a maniacal, genocidal Shia caliphate that is bent upon our annihilation. And those are not just words. They say it. They mean it. They've invested billions and billions of dollars towards this goal. And we just yearn, pray, and try to defend ourselves. And that's the role of the IDF is to defend Israel, to, not just Israel, not just world Jewry, but to defend the world against Iran and its six proxies, Persia and its six proxies, and their goal of obtaining a Shia caliphate that dominates the world. Thank you. I want to wish everyone a very meaningful, very happy Purim. It's a day when we can look back after 2,600 years the Jewish people are still alive. They're still thriving. They're rebuilding in the land of Israel, in their ancestral homeland. And pray that that continues. Thank you very much.